a genomic library is when you take um, an entire genome. Now, in this example, I've just got, you know, a pink line illustrating my entire genome. But basically, you take an entire genome and you fragment it through a partial digest. You really need to know what a partial digest is, right? It's when you digest with a restriction enzyme, but you don't give it time for every piece of the genome to get cut at every single site, right? So you develop these overlapping pieces. Uh, this is really important if you're going to try and sequence a genome because you could do a complete digestion. You could fragment all of the pieces of the genome into all of the fragments possible, but you wouldn't then know how the fragments went back together because a restriction digest, you don't necessarily know anything about the sequence of the DNA that you're digesting. Right? You just take a genome. What's the sequence of the genome? We have no idea. We just know that restriction enzymes are going to be occurring at a certain frequency in there. And those restriction sequences, if we digest it, would get cut. If you do a partial digest, that means when you generate, say, for instance, this piece between this restriction site and this restriction site, if that piece of genome only cut, cut there and there, then I've got this fragment, and then I've got this fragment here. Now, those ones don't overlap. I couldn't put them back together. But on a, if on a different strand, one of the other strands of this genome that's in your sample got cut at this site and something else, well, then that original piece that was this size and the new piece in this other one is going to overlap by that little sequence. So when I actually go through and, and, and determine what the actual nucleotide sequence of both these pieces are, I'm going to have that region that's common on one end of one of them, and that same sequence is going to be on the other end, and so I can line them back up and, and figure out what the entire sequence was. So a library is taking all of these random fragments and cloning all of those fragments into vectors of some sort. We talked last time, if you're doing a genomic library, the first step would be to do um, make, generate big pieces of the genome and put those all in like BACs, bacterial artificial chromosomes, so we can get big chunks. Then you could subclone further. You could fragment that big piece and put it into smaller plasmids. But when you're creating a library, you're just taking whatever pieces you generated and cloning them all into, into vectors. Getting all of those vectors to be transformed by bacteria and then plating those bacteria out, growing all the bacteria on a, a series of auger plates. So you would take your genome, your genomic library that you've generated, it, which is basically a bunch of vectors that contain all these little different inserts. Uh, you would transform bacteria with all of these ones, and you'd plate them out. And this is a, obviously a very simplified version of it, but you would have a plate that's generating now a bunch of different colonies of bacteria, and all of them are carrying different fragments from that original, uh, uh, original fragmentation that you did of the genome. Now, to actually get a whole genome like this, you would probably have you know, a dozen plates, and on every single one of those dozen plates, you would have hundreds of colonies right, to generate, you know, to capture all of the fragments that you had originally. So a genomic library is actually going to be a whole stack of plates, all of those plates carrying hundreds of colonies on each one, and each colony represents a bacterial plasmid or BAC or whatever the vector was containing a random fragment of your insert, right? So that's the library. It's just all these colonies of bacteria growing your pieces. Usually the first thing you want to do when you've gone through all the effort of fragmenting that cloning them all, transforming them all, getting all these bacteria plated out, you now have one copy of the library in that stack of plates. Uh, usually the first thing you do is make a copy of that library and send it to somebody else and have them freeze it down. Probably make a third copy, send that to somebody else so that you've got multiple copies. Because if you have some you know, mold contamination issue and all of your plates just start overgrowing with mold, then you've lost all the work of that colony or all of that library that you've made. So usually what you do is you make copies of it. This is how you make a copy of a library. So I would have one of my plates, right? I'm going to have a stack of these plates. Uh, you take a little stamp. So you take some like velvet cloth, something that's got a lot of fabric on it, and you make a little stamp that fits the size of your plate. Uh, you take that little stamp, and you've got all those colonies growing, and you just press it right on there, lift it up, and then attached to your stamp is 
some of the colonies that were originally growing on your plate. Right? Then you take that stamp, you stamp it on a new plate that doesn't have any bacteria on it, and you've m just basically made a replica of what that original plate looked like. Okay? Because what we're going to do is start sequencing through all of those colonies, all of the, uh, the fragments that those colonies contain. And so if I have picked this one, and I send my, you know, I'm trying to do a genome project, and I've sent my plates out to somebody else, I want them to know that I've already worked on that colony. We don't want to duplicate our efforts that way. So you stamp it out, and you get a colony that grows exactly like this one does. And so then you can communicate to your collaborator, OK, on plate number one, I have, I have already started working on this colony. And you give them a location on the plate. And they know on their plate, they don't have to worry about that colony but they can start picking a different colony, right? So you're categorizing your, your library. Questions about making duplicate plates of a library or, or setting up a library in general? I'm going to start talking about permutations of this, so I want to make sure you guys are clear about what the, just the generic process is. Make sense? Sure, no. <laughs> All right. If there's questions that come up, I really want you to ask, so. So that's a genomic library, because our starting material was a genome that we randomly fragmented. We did this partial digest fragment. Uh, you can make a library of anything, right? Uh, whatever you want to fragment, whatever pieces of DNA, whatever your original source of DNA or RNA is, you could just take all of those pieces, clone them all into separate vectors, grow them all up in these colonies of bacteria, and you've generated a library. Uh, so genomic libraries are common, but mRNA libraries are really common as well. Um, in an mRNA library, what you would do is you'd say, well, what are the mRNAs that are being expressed in this tissue type, for example? So you could take you know, liver cells. You could take liver cells from an organism. You could isolate all of the mRNA that's in that liver tissue. And then you could just clone all of the mRNAs, right? You're going to have thousands of mRNAs that are expressed in liver cells. You would just clone them all into vectors. You transform those all into bacteria. And then you'd grow up a plate that represents colonies are all clones of the mRNAs that are expressed in that tissue. And you could do comparative studies at this point, too, right? You could make an mRNA library for liver and then an mRNA for kidney, right? And look at what are the mRNAs that are different in those two cells. Right? Some of the mRNAs are going to be the same, right? Every cell has got to, you know, express the enzymes for doing glycolysis, right? So the mRNA for hexokinase, the, the first enzyme in, in glycolysis, is probably going to be in almost virtually every cell in your body. But there's going to be things that kidney cells do that are unique to the kidney cells and things that liver cells do that are unique. And so they're going to be expressing unique genes. So this is a way to profile and see what are the actual genes that are expressed in this certain tissue. You could also do developmental stage. And if you're looking at an embryo and you want to know what's the difference between you know, this molt of this worm and the second molt of this worm, well, you could make mRNA libraries for both of them and compare what genes are being expressed in them. You could do this also for a diseased state, right? If you've got a diseased liver, well, you could take healthy liver tissue and diseased liver tissue, look at all of the mRNAs that are expressed, and see what the difference is between those two. Right? That would give you an idea of what's going wrong, what's, what's actually happening in that disease. Um, I mean, you could come up with a list of you know, a thousand different ways you could do this. You know, same organism living in different environments. What are the genes that it turns on to compensate if it's living in a cold environment versus a hot environment? Or so this would be a cDNA library, because you started with RNA, mRNA, converted it into DNA, and then cloned all of these. Yeah. You start with mRNA. And so a cDNA library is because you've taken that mRNA and turned it into the complementary strand of DNA. Because to put it into a vector, it's got to be in DNA. So you've got to take RNA, convert it to DNA, then put it, clone it into your vector. 
Now, if you're going to do comparisons like I've talked about now, you're having to sequence every single thing in your library, right? Because if all you've done is cloned in every single mRNA in one of the, one of the tissues, then you're going to have to go through and pick every single one of those colonies that you generated in your library, right? You're going to have thousands and thousands of bacterial colonies. You'd have to go in, pick that colony, grow that colony up to high enough amounts that you could actually get enough DNA out of it, sequence what's in the plasmid, and then that would tell you what mRNA is there. Then you'd have to pick the next colony, sequence that, pick the next colony, sequence, and you may get duplicates, right? You might end up picking colonies and they all contain the same gene, right? Uh, this is a really tedious, time-consuming process. Uh, I want to talk about what's called screening a library. If what you're interested in is, is this one gene expressed in my tissue or not, you don't have to then sequence every single thing to look for that gene. You could just go and screen through the library and say, and ask the library specifically, or use the library to ask the question, is this RNA present in that tissue sample? The way you would do that is you have to make a probe. Because I've got all these colonies, and I'm just trying to test for which one of those, or does any one of those colonies express this mRNA that I'm interested in, okay? So this requires you to know something about the mRNA sequence. But for a lot of organisms, we have their genome sequenced. We know what the mRNA sequences are. But we just don't know whether the liver is expressing it or not, right? We know that this mRNA exists in the genome, and the question would be, does the liver express this mRNA? Well, if you've got an MR or a cDNA library for the liver, then you can design a probe for the mRNA you're interested in. And a probe is just going to be an anti-sense sequence, something that has complementary sequence to the mRNA that you want to know if it's there or not. Okay? So you could make that. There's several ways to make it, and we can go into that la later. But basically, you just get some small sequence that is anti-sense to it. That's the complement of the mRNA that we want to see if it's there. And then you're going to have to label it, right? What we're going to do is grow up a bunch of these colonies, extract DNA from them that's part of their, you know, all these fragments of, or the, the pieces of mRNA that have been cloned into their vectors. We'll isolate that, uh, that DNA that's in them. And then we're going to test for seeing if that probe is going to complementary stick to any of the DNA that comes out of those colonies. Okay, so once it sticks, we're going to need a way to see it. And so you have to, you have to label it somehow. Uh, several ways you could do this. You could label it radioactively. This is how it was first developed. You make this piece of antisense DNA, and you put a radioactive phosphate group in it. So it's radioactively labeled. That will show up on film. It'll be, you know, exposing film. You could put an antigenic compound on it. That is, you could make this piece of antisense RNA and then put some molecule on it that an antibody recognizes. And that way you could use an antibody to detect where that probe stuck. You could also fluorescently label it. There's a bunch of labeling techniques that you could use. Okay. I'm just going to talk about the simplest one, just if you radioactively labeled that probe. Okay. So the process is this. You would have your plate. Well, basically, you'd go into the library and you would make a replica copy of it, right? You want to keep your, your uh, library safe, so it's usually frozen, and you've got all those bacteria frozen out. If you're actually going to do an experiment, you go and grab one of the plates, you make a stamp of it, you grow it up on a new plate, and you put the original library back in the freezer, right? You keep, keep that in storage. So you make yourself a replica plate, and then you grow those colonies up. So those colonies grow, lots of bacteria grows on them. And then you can actually uh, you grow the colonies, and you stick a little filter. So this white thing on the top of it is a little membrane, piece of membrane on it. Okay? So all of the bacteria are not just growing on an auger plate. They're growing on a little membrane. So you let them grow for a while. You pick up that membrane, and I've got all those pieces of you know, all of those colonies of bacteria growing on that. Then you extract the DNA from it 
So you lyse all the cells, all the cells burst open, all the DNA starts spilling out of the cells. And you could actually, if, you've got, if you're using the right filter, you can get all of that DNA to stick. Basically, you get the DNA to covalently bond to the filter. So wherever there used to be a colony growing on the filter, you lyse the cells, you cross-link the DNA to the filter, and instead, just all, all the DNA that was in those colonies is now sticking to the filter. Okay? So you have to go through a couple of steps. You have to lyse the cells, you have to wash and make sure all the fats and the lipids and everything gets off and make sure that the DNA stays, stays on your filter. At that point, though, you can actually probe with your antisense probe. Right? All the DNA from the plasmids, all the cloned pieces, are there on your filter. And if you've got your antisense probe, you just put your probe in, and you can just do this in a little bag or something. Right? You stick your filter in there with all the DNA. In red is all your labeled probe. You just put that in a buffered solution, and you just let it uh, let those two interact. And wherever, if your mRNA is expressed in this tissue, your antisense probe is going to stick to the actual mRNA sequence from the cDNA that's in this, right? So you let that soak for a while, you wash it off, and then you take your filter with all that DNA and you expose it to film. Go in a dark room, you take your filter and you put it in a little, you know, light closed box. You put a piece of film on top of it, you close that cartridge up, and you let the radioactivity expose your film. Okay? You open it up, you develop the film, and then what comes out is if your mRNA is actually expressed in your tissue, it will, you'll have a single unique spot where it's been able to hybridize to. Right? This is saying, yes, your mRNA is expressed in this tissue. Right? Because in the mRNA that we originally isolated from it was in those bacteria, and it's sticking specifically to your probe. So this is called screening a library. So you could just screen through. Once you've developed this, this guy, uh, the limit is just how many probes you want to make. Right? If you want to see, is hexokinase ex expressed? When you make a probe to hexokinase, screen through all of the plates in your library and see if it shows up. If you want to look at any other specific genes, you can test to see whether it's expressed in your tissue. Make sense? Yeah. Are these all the labeling techniques just these three, or do you uh, have a color metric? With yeah, the yeah, there's other labeling techniques. Uh, you know, so fluorescently, you could do it fluorescently. There's other ways that it just turns a, a separate color, not a fluorescent color. Yeah, there's all kinds of ways to label them. Is this just so. a better one, or is it? Well, this is just easy for illustration purposes. Okay. But yeah, if, if you got something, if your probe was actually a color, then you wouldn't have to expose it to film, right? You could just look directly at your filter. Because right. like absorbance would be cheaper, right? Yeah, I mean, because here you have to waste film, right? Yeah. If you could look at it directly, yeah. The nice thing about this, though, is you could repeat this again. Right? You could wash away all the probe, mm -hmm. just get a different probe, put your filter right back in the bag, and screen it for a different, for a different gene. Then expose that to film, and then maybe this one is expressing that other gene. Right? So you can use a filter over and over. Because all that DNA, it's all covalently bound to your filter. So it's going to stay there for, for a long time. So you just wash the probe away. The only reason the probe is sticking is because it's just base pairing. Right? So if you take that, that stuck probe there on your filter, if you just put it in really hot water, you just boil it, basically, all the hydrogen bonds are going to break. And now you've got a clean, clean filter again. Put a different probe on it. Well, you, got, you have a question? No, this was actually wondering if the steps are something we're going to have to know. Um, <laughs> I, I don't care that you know necessarily the steps of like everything, but I want you to know that you're screening this by trying to probe for the DNA that was originally in your in your um, in your library, right? So, you know, you're going to have to grow up the the colonies in your library, and you have to extract DNA from them, and then you need to probe. I mean, that's the idea I'm trying to get at. Okay. Right? You're just testing yes or no at this point, right? Would my probe stick to anything? If it does, then that, that mRNA was expressed in your original tissue. Mm -hmm. So don't worry so much about the, okay. the detailed steps of it. But I mean, you kind of have to know to understand what's going on here, yeah, right? I get what you're 
All right. So that's libraries. We're going to shift now. That's where I was hoping to get done last time. But we're going to shift now and start talking about sequencing. Um, originally, there was two different sequencing methods that were developed uh, right around the same time. One was by this guy named Fred Sanger. Um, he's the guy that won two Nobel Prizes, one for developing a way to sequence amino acid sequences, so protein sequences. And then he also developed a mechanism to sequence DNA. Uh, the other one was by two guys, um, Maxim and Gilbert. Um, they were both really clever ways to sequence DNA. And that was the first time we were actually able to actually nucleotide by nucleotide decide what the DNA sequence was. Uh, the Maxim and Gilbert method is a little bit cumbersome. And so it quickly kind of fell out of favor. So what I'm going to talk about right now is what's called Sanger sequencing, or it's called dideoxy sequencing. And I'll, I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, Sanger sequencing is even kind of out on the outs now, uh, because it's expensive and it only gets you short reads. So we'll talk about traditionally what Sanger sequencing is, because it gets you the idea of how do you sequence DNA. Uh, but then we'll start going into what's called next generation sequencing methods. And these are really high throughput, very quick, very cheap uh, ways to, to sequence. And there's a whole host of them that are popping up now. Um, we're kind of in the, I don't know, selection phase of sequencing right now. There's, all, there's like a dozen, half a dozen different uh, next generation technologies. And they're all kind of competing for which one's quickest and which one's cheapest and which one's more robust. So we'll kind of just see how the market plays out and which one uh, tends to dominate. But Sanger dominated for, you know, 30 years or so. If you were going to sequence something, you were going to do it the Sanger method. What Sanger did is he used a DNA polymerase. So you're going to start out with a template piece of DNA, and you're going to use a DNA polymerase to make a copy. So basically, what you're doing is generating a new piece, and we're going to sequence what that new piece is. And from that new piece, we'll know what the original template complement was. The way he does this is you develop this guy. This is called a dideoxy nucleotide. So ribonucleic acid is a ribose that has two OH groups here. A deoxy ribose, right? the difference between DNA and RNA, is whether there's an OH group at the second carbon. So this is a deoxy, or a DNA nucleotide. A dideoxy is lacking the oxygen group on the third carbon as well. So both the second and the third carbon just have hydrogens there. They don't have OH groups. Okay. Now, this is significant because if this nucleotide got incorporated into a newly synthesized strand, so if RNA polymerase is working along putting nucleotides in, and if it grabbed this nucleotide, it could stick this in because it's attached from its five prime group. right? The RNA polymerase is moving down. It puts in a nucleotide. And what it's going to do is attach the next nucleotide on the third carbon of that nucleotide it just put down, right? Because we always synthesize um, on the, the three prime end, right? So you, the end of your strand has an open three prime group. It puts the next nucleotide and connects that next nucleotide through its fifth carbon, right? So if this is the next one that's going in the strand, you could put this nucleotide in, right? I would cleave off these two phosphates. And this nucleotide would be incorporated into the strand by attaching this guy from its 5 prime through the phosphate to the previous one's 3 prime carbon. Right? That's just how we polymerize DNA. What this guy will do, though, is make it unable to put another nucleotide on. Because right? once this guy gets incorporated into the DNA strand, there is no oxygen group on that third carbon. So you can't stick another nucleotide on. If one of these dideoxys get incorporated into your strand, you have stopped the ability of, of DNA polymerase to continue to polymerize this. So we call this a chain terminating nucleotide. Will? Uh, you actually answered the question. I was okay. About that. Okay, great. Thank you. So Sanger developed these just you know, using organic chemistry, popped off the oxygen groups on these nucleotides. And you develop one for each nucleotide in the strand that you want to sequence. So you can make dideoxy A's, dideoxy G's, dideoxy C's. 
And so any time one of those gets incorporated, it's going to stop the strand from being synthesized. Okay? So to sequence a template, you set up four different reactions for the four different nucleotides that you're looking for, uh, that we're sequencing for, right? You, number one, you radioactively label a primer. Okay, so we have to know something about our sequence because RNA polymerase cannot start replicating unless you have a primer. So you have to get some part of a primer double-stranded section set up, right? So here's the template that I'm trying to sequence in blue. And so I have to know something about at least a part of the sequence in order to get the primer to stick, okay? Now, we could just have taken an unknown piece of DNA, and you could just ligate on some sequence that you know, right? We talked about ligating those little um, uh, handles for doing cloning, specific cloning on the ends. You could just take your unknown piece of DNA, take a sequence that you already know the sequence is, just get DNA ligase to stick those together. Then you know what that sequence you put on the front was, okay? So you could use that, some known piece of sequence, and you put a primer there, just, you know, an anti-sense piece, okay? Now, in the four different tubes, you put in very, very small amounts of just one of the dideoxynucleotides, okay? So in one tube, in this one, you have very, very small amounts of the dideoxy A. Now, all the other nucleotides are there, too. There's regular A's, there's regular T's, regular G's, regular C's, all the free nucleotides that you need to polymerase, polymerize this strand. But you just throw in just a couple, just a few dideoxy A's, okay? So what's going to happen then is when, it's basically like a PCR reaction, right? I put in all these nucleotides, I've got my template, I've got my primer, you put in polymerase, you heat it up, and the polymerase will start making copies. Right? And so DNA polymerase comes, sits down, it sees a T, it grabs a, a normal regular A nucleotide and sticks it in there. Moves down, sees a, a C, puts a G in there, finds a G, goes all the way down, but then very, very randomly and very, very occasionally, when it gets to a T, it might stick the dideoxy in there, okay? which is going to mean that that strand doesn't polymerize anymore. It just stops, right? Well, then just like PCR, you heat up the tube. You know, you let this reaction go. You heat up the tube. Everything separates out again. The RNA, you know, then you cool it down. You let the primer anneal. You get to the extending phase. RNA polymerase sits down again. And this time, it only makes it to the first T, and a dideoxy gets stuck in there. And so that chain is done until you boil the sample again. Well, boil the sample again, separate it out, anneal, go again, it goes down, and maybe this time it comes to the last T, and it's the last T that gets the dyed deoxynucleotide in there. What I'm doing in this whole PCR reaction is I'm generating random fragments that are all slightly different in size, but what's in common is that they all end in an A. Right? Every time it stopped, I knew that's where an A ended because that's the only dideoxy that's in that tube. You do the same reaction for G's, C's, and T's. And so what you've got is four separate tubes. They all have random sized fragments, all stopping at whatever nucleotide the dideoxy was. So then you just run these out on a gel. Here's the dideoxy A. I got a piece that's eight base pairs long. So at eight base pairs, I know there was an A. I run out the rest of it at six base pairs. So all of these fragments now, you have to run a very, very long, very high, um, uh, high percentage gel because we're separating bands out one base pair apart from each other. So they're only differing in size by one nucleotide. Uh, so this is a difficult gel to run, actually. But so here, Two nucleotides later, there's a six nucleotide piece that must have ended in an A as well. You scroll all the way down at the one nucleotide. So one nucleotide longer than the primer is this piece, and that must have ended in an A. So you run these all out in four parallel lanes, and then you just read from the bottom up, right? 
the smallest fragments I get was an A at the first nucleotide position. The next nucleotide was a G. Then there was two Cs. Then there was a T. Then an A. G, A, C. And so by reading up the gel, I'm reading the sequence that must have been in that original template strand, or, or the complement of what must have been in the template strand. So I think I have one way to do this to sequence it. Yeah. And there has to be some strange streamlined way, or wouldn't it take forever to sequence? A long time. <laughs> yeah, that's why the genome project took forever. <laughs> because you, I mean, you had to make a genomic library, so you had to take every single, isolate every single chromosome, fragment every single chromosome into big uh, genomic library pieces in backs. Then every single one of those backs got sent out to a lab, and they fragmented that back into smaller plasmids and made a genomic library of each of the backs. So that's called subcloning, right? So I made a library of big pieces, and then for each one of those pieces in that library, I made another library, a subset library. And then you had to grow up an individual colony, and then you had to grow up enough DNA to isolate it, and you had to do four different reactions. And now, you can run it out on a bigger gel, but here there's still just four lanes, and as I read up this, so here I'm reading the sequence, C, G, A, T, T, G, A, T, C, A, A. But you only get about, at most, like our best technology right now gets you about a thousand base pairs. Okay, a thousand base pairs. All the further you get. I mean, yeah, it's awesome, but you have three billion base pairs in your genome. <laughs> this is way to go. Yeah. So this took a long time, right? As soon as you read this, well, you know about a thousand base pairs. Great. Now you can design a new primer that sits a thousand base pairs down further. You repeat the whole process again, and now you can get two thousand. Then you develop another primer, do four sequence. You can do another one. And then, yeah, but you got to make sure everything's overlapping, and you have to keep going back to make sure you got full coverage, right? Now this this takes a long time. <laughs> this takes a long time. Yeah. When you're reading up the gel. You're finding the sequence of the complement of your template, right? The template, whatever you started with is, is here. You put your primer on, and the first band that you're reading is this piece of primer plus an A, right? If I were to just run the primer just by itself, it would run down here at zero, right? So that, that piece of primer would be that length. This piece of DNA is the length of the primer plus the first nucleotide that got put on in that complement that was being made. Okay. Yeah. How'd you ever get the first strand? Um, well, you just fragment the genome into tiny little pieces. You synthesize a piece of DNA that you want, that you know what it is, right? Um, you synthesize T, 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 right? You just make a, you have an organic chemist make you T's all together. You take one of the fragments that you want to start with, and you take your TTTT, and you get DNA ligase to stick them together. So now I know at least what I know that I should make my primer A, 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 right? So you take that new piece of synthetic piece of DNA, you, you boil it in the sample, you put an A, A, A primer, that sticks right there, and then now you've started to sequence unknown sequence that you never saw before, right? So you just, you just start somewhere. <laughs> And then that's somewhere on this fragment of this fragment of this chromosome of the genome, right? And so you just start piecing it together. It's just a huge jigsaw puzzle. Is it, is it have to be uh, person operated still, this process? Or can they develop, like, yeah. assembly line, so to speak? It's probably a bad for it, but. Yeah, no, I'm, and we'll get into next generation technologies, but yeah, you can automate this to a certain extent, right? I mean, you don't have to have a single person setting up all the individual reactions, right? You can get a robot to, you know, move liquids into, you know, 96 wells at the same time, you know, put 96 primers, 96 templates, 96 polymerases, you put that whole plate in the sequencer, and so you can sequence 96 times. And then, you know, you could have somebody, somebody used to, the way you had to do it is, 
where you first started the human genome, you had to do it all by individual hand. Now we started scaling up, you got robots, and so the robots could set up 96 reactions in one plate. But you still had to go put that in the thermocycler and let it run, and then take it out and load all of these reactions, 96 reactions on, on a gel here. Here's a big, this gel's about this wide, this tall, wow. and it's got 96 tiny little wells all across the top of it. <laughs> And so you take your plate of 96 sequencing reactions, you take number one and you load it on, number two and you load it on. <laughs> and so you, you run all of those wells, 96 across it, you let them all run out, <laughs> and then you expose, it, you expose it to film, and then you spend the rest of the day you know, counting up the <laughs> nucleotides, right? Typing them into a word processing program, right? I mean, that's how you started. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> the, the, first, the first thing that really helped was instead of just radioactively labeling your probe, um, that's just the probe is generically labeled, right? Um, this is the thing that's labeled that's turning the film a color, right? And every label, if it's, just a phos if it's just a radioactively labeled phosphate, then it's just black, right? So you have to run these all in separate lanes because it's just the primer that's labeled, and so it's the size of the piece and the lane that you're running it in that tells you that that's an A, right? So a band there says, well, the primer was labeled, and it, since it was in the A column, it must be an A, right? Um, what helped is we developed um, fluorescent molecules that you could attach to the actual base. So instead of attaching it to uh, the, the label to the, to the primer, we attached a label to the dideoxynucleotide base. Okay. So instead of reading the primer, you're reading the last nucleotide that got incorporated in. That's what's, on, that's what's labeled. And you could label each of those a separate color, which basically allows you to do all four reactions in the same tube. Right? Because they're all using the same primer. The primer sequence can be the same. If each dideoxynucleotide is labeled a different color, then I can put all of those together and I can do all four reactions at the same time. Then when you run the pieces out, this is just a cartoon, but if you think of this as the gel and I loaded my sample on here, if the smallest piece after the primer was a T, T's are labeled red. So you look, and the, you actually get a laser to read this for you, but basically, if you were to look at it, uh, the T piece is fluorescing red. Right? The next nucleotide up got stopped at a G, and the G is fluorescing yellow. So I know what those are now, not based on what lane I loaded them in, but what color the nucleotide, the dideoxynucleotide is fluorescing. Right? So you still do the same, th same technology. Right? You still got to load it on a gel. You got to run all those pieces out so that their one base pair separates from each other. And then you read from the bottom of the gel. But now I can read all four lanes, all four nucleotides in the same lane. Right? So you still read up from the bottom. So T, G, C, G, 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 C, A, A, or I'm sorry, C, T, T. All of the nucleotides are labeled in a different fluorescent color. So this helps a little bit, right? You don't have to do four lanes for a sequencing reaction. You can just run one lane. But you still have to run them out. Um, oh my God. This is a really old <laughs> automated sequencer. Um, this, this terribly tan yellow thing is actually a really cool Mac, right? Yeah. <laughs> At one time, Macs were actually tan. Um, this is an automated sequencer. So here is a, a sequencing gel. Uh, it's a really thin gel that's poured between two plates. Uh, I've got a demo in the lab that I'll set up and I'll show you um, next week. But it's very, very thin gel pressed between these two big glass plates. And so it sits vertically here, <coughs> and the samples get loaded from the top and they run down. Um, an automated sequencer um, has a laser in there, and it just detects when one of the fragments moves by the laser. So you load your sample at the top. There's a laser that keeps scanning back and forth across the bottom, 
And every time a fragment of DNA passes through, if the scanner goes by and detects that it was fluorescing, it just records at, at, the, at a certain time I saw that color pass by. Okay? So what you get is something like this. Now, it, uh, one point to remember. In this guy, um, if you load your sample at the top, you can only run this as far down as the smallest sample, right? The smallest sample has to stay on the gel. If you run this further, you're going to lose the bottom piece, right? If, if I kept running this gel, that C is going to just run off the bottom of the gel and I'm not going to see it anymore, right? So you can only run it out so that the bottom one is at the bottom, right? I'm limited by the size of my gel, right? So what happens is, well, I've got good readable sequence here, but as soon as I get up here to these really big pieces, there might be really big pieces and they're all one base pair apart from each other, but the gel just can't separate, right? the size of a 1,001 base pair piece of DNA, you can't separate from a 1,002 base pair piece, right? The gel is just unable to separate those two. So you get a big glob there, and you can't read those, right? So here, on, on a traditional guy where you have to expose it to radioactivity, you can only actually get a couple of hundred bases, right? But what a automated sequencer allows you to do is the size of the gel is actually irrelevant, right? Because I can load my sample on the top, the smallest piece comes down here and it gets read by the laser, right? So the smallest piece goes by, the laser reads it and it records it. Well, then I can keep running the gel and I'll just run that fragment off the bottom of the gel. And then the next fragment comes, the laser reads it, it records it, and then you can keep running the gel. So this is what ex allows you to extend the reads from only a couple of hundred base pairs up to a thousand base pairs. But up to a certain point, gels just can't resolve big pieces of DNA anymore, so you reach kind of an upper limit of about a thousand. Just using a gel to separate pieces just only gets you a certain resolution. Okay. So in these automated sequencers, though, basically the computer regenerates what that lane would have looked like if you had run it out and took a picture of it. But really, it was just recording when the samples went by. Right? So it records when the samples went by, and it says, uh, well, let's look at this one here. Right, it records, OK, well, first I saw an A go by, and then I saw three Ts go by, and then I saw a G go by. And these are just time points that it's recorded. Well, then it just makes you a graphical illustration of what that gel would have looked like had you taken a picture of it. Right? So, this is, a, this is only 24 lanes out of a 96 well reaction that went on here, though. So this, this increases, right? We're doing 96 at a time. The Human Genome Project started moving a little bit faster when we got here, right? So. Uh, you were saying that we make, we make the uh, DNA fluoresce, the big pair of fluoresce, or well, do they organic, organic chemists have made fluorescent molecules. So when they're making the dideoxynucleotide, they put in a yellow fluorescing molecule on that dideoxy. Um, and then when they're making a dideoxy T, they put a red fluorescing molecule on that. So it's organic chemists that figured out these dyes. So. And, and maybe you'll reach this, uh, but is there, is there not, have we not developed a way to just have the DNA be red without having to use gel? Mm -hmm. That's what these next generation sequencing methods are doing. Yeah. But I want to give you the historical one, the traditional, because I think it makes more sense to think about this first. Uh, here, here's another way that you could graphically illustrate what an automated sequencer saw. Uh, basically, it just says the absorbance of the fluorescing dye on, on the y axis here, and on the x axis is. Basically, what it's doing is recording the length of the piece of DNA that went by. Uh, it's actually just recording the time that it took. You know, the, the la you just said go on the laser and it just started reading. And it took a certain number of um, time units before it saw a fluorescence, right? So it's actually showing you the time. Uh, we can actually coordinate that into base pair number, right? 
So that's what's on top here, is it saying, well, base pair numbers. So here is a really clean sequence. You see really clear peaks at a certain time point. It saw a T go by, and so I know at position, whatever this is, 120, I saw a T go by. And then at 121, another T fluorescing molecule went by. Uh, yellow is hard to see, so Gs typically get shown as black, but the actual fluorescing molecule was yellow. So. This is called a chromatogram, it's just you know, showing you the absorbance of the, the fluorescence. All right, let's talk about next generation sequencing. So even at our best, Sanger sequencing right, only gets you about 1,000 nucleotides. Um, you have to wait for the PCR reaction to go. And you can only do it one at a time, right? You do the sequencing reaction, you sequence that piece, you run it out, and then you got to do it again. Uh, I'm going to talk about two different methods, and like I said, there's about half a dozen different technologies that do varying things. I'm going to take two examples of kind of the two classes of next generation sequencing. Uh, first is pyro sequencing. Um, pyro sequencing is going to detect. Uh, what nucleotide got put in right at the moment of polymerization, okay? In Sanger sequencing, we don't know what got put in at the time the polymerase was doing. You read the sample by taking the finished product and running it out on a gel, right? In pyro sequencing, they're detecting right in the actual, when the actual polymerase puts the nucleotide in, you're going to try and detect what nucleotide got put in. So you don't have to wait for it to be done and then run it out on a gel. You're just doing it kind of in real time, okay? So that's um, basically real time sequencing. The other is hybridization sequencing. This other class, this is when you don't even use a polymerase. Instead of using a polymerase to read, because the, the, real, uh, the real hero of these early sequencing is the DNA polymerase, right? It is what's reading the nucleotide and deciding what the appropriate nucleotide is to go in. And you're just reading the fragments that it made, right? Just clever ways to colorize what happened, right? Uh, in hybridization sequencing, we don't even use a polymerase. Hybridization really decreases the cost of sequencing because really the most expensive thing in sequencing, number one, is making the nucleotides. But then even more expensive that, than that is expensive polymerase. Polymerase only a happens, you know, only acts for so long. You had to make, get a bacteria to make that polymerase. It takes a lot of biochemistry to isolate the polymerase, keep it active. Um, it's just expensive to use enzymes. In hybridization sequencing, we're not going to use a polymerase. We're just going to make a bunch of generic pieces and allow the, the specific base pairing of nucleotides to tell us what the sequence was. Right, so instead of relying on a polymerase to go and read the nucleotide and put the appropriate next nucleotide in, we're just gonna make a bunch of probes, basically, and whatever probe hybridizes, we'll know what the sequence was because we know that bases only, you know, T's only uh, base pair with C's. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, T's only go with A's, uh, G's only go with C's. So based on how a probe hybridizes to your template would tell you what the, what the sequence was. Um, we are running desperately out of time. So I'm just going to show you, I've got a little video here of pyro sequencing. So I'll show you the video of pyro sequencing. Next time, we'll talk through the steps and what it takes to do this. Um, but this will be a fun thing to leave with on a Friday. Um, you know what? The pyro sequencing just has goofy music going on with it, so I'm not going to turn on the sound. I'm just going to show you. I'll show you this again next time with the, with the goofy music. All right. So here's your template. Remember, pyro sequencing is using a polymerase. So here's a nucleotide that got incorporated. And let me back this up for just, well, so that nucleotide got incorporated. Those two little balls that came off were the two phosphate groups that got cleaved off of the triphosphate nucleotide. Right? The reason these nucleotides get in is that they're triphosphate. The polymerase cleaves the two phosphates off when it puts it in the thing. And so I've got these two uh, phosphate groups. 
um, there's an enzyme that's in the reaction here that converts those and makes an ATP molecule out of them again. Okay? So that's just detecting that a nucleotide got put in. Okay? Oh. So here. So here, triphosphate nucleotides come in. Here's a, what is that, a C, so a G got put in, and the two phosphates came off that triphosphate. This gets incorporated into a new ATP molecule, and then this luciferase takes that ATP molecule, breaks it down, and you get a light, a burst of light comes out of your sample. So every little sample is being recorded by a little, uh, you know, uh, uh, spectrophotometer, reading wavelengths of light. Right? So in this case, we just got three nucleotides incorporated. And the light is going to be then three times more than that first one. Right? So I put in G nucleotides, and I got a light spike. So I know one G was there. Then I put in A nucleotides, and I got a three high spike. So I know that three A's must have been next. Now you put in new nucleotides. I put in, in this case, uh, these are T's. But what this is is a C, so I didn't get any light. So it says that wasn't the right nucleotide. So you put in new nucleotides again. So I put in uh, C nucleotides. And so yeah, there's two G's there. It's going to get converted into two bursts of light. I get a double peak. And so that tells me that there must have been two C's there. So I'm watching every single nucleotide actually get incorporated as it goes. So yeah, that requires you to, to, to put one nucleotide at a time go in, right? They put in T's. Are there any T's there? No? OK, put in C's. Are there any C's in there? Oh yeah, there was one. I got a one light spike. Well, now I put in G's. Are there any G's there? So you just have to keep cycling the nucleotides through. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.